Good evening, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, part of the Cover One Sports Network. I am one of your three hosts, Anthony Prohaska, normally joined by just Kendall the last several weeks. Kendall, <laughs> how do we feel now that Eric is is back again? He seems to go back. He seems to leave us. How do we feel right now? Are we upset? Are we happy? How do we feel, Kendall? <laughs> Not going to lie, I feel kind of like an object to him, mm, you know, just like I'm being used, <laughs> just thrown about, just thrown you know, about. I love how you guys, I love how you, you waited till we went live to, to air the grievances here. <laughs> out in front of the public so everyone can see, uh, but no, we are, uh, yeah. we're very excited to have you back. You were gone last week, but welcome, and uh, thanks Thank for joining you. us. How are you feeling, Eric, after uh, taking some time to do some other stuff? Good, good. Yeah, uh, work pulled me out last week, um, but uh, today was my son's second birthday, so it was beautiful outside. Got to hang out with him for the day. Um, they're going down right now, so I had a few hours to join you guys in the film room to talk some cornerbacks and some top 30 visits for the Bills, and I was like, well, why not? You know, another Tuesday night, another film session with the boys. I'm ready. I'm very excited. I also am very excited for this comment from Jason who said, who's the new guy? <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> That's very good. Um, but Eric, you hit it right on the head. You know, we are, we're actually like two weeks and two days away from night That's one crazy. of the NFL draft. I know time moves so fast. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm, I was just yesterday that my heart was being ripped out from that chiefs game. Um, <laughs> actually maybe that was yesterday cause I was watching parts of that game. So that's actually kind of oh accurate, but we are, yeah, I'm a, I'm a glutton for punishment, but we're close. Right. And teams are close. And within that, we start to see, these top 30 visits, we start to see players coming in to meet with teams, to have private workouts. There is a difference between those two things. And in tonight's episode, we're going to break down some film of three of the players that the Bills brought in um, for their top 30 visits. And, you know, we continue to use that phrase, top 30 visit, top 30 visit. You'll see it on Twitter. You'll see it out on the old interwebs. Kendall, why don't you break down what that means and what the overall you know theme of that is for teams? The way I view it is it's essentially a way to get a better look at a guy you may not have gotten a proper look at. It, many different touch points through this pre-draft process. You know, you have just scouting throughout the season. You, you have the Senior Bowl. You have East-West Shrine Bowl, all that stuff, combines, pro days, all of that. But if you never get a chance to meet anyone, this is your chance to get a more intimate kind of look behind the curtain at who this guy is character-wise, um, who he is obviously on the field as a football player. That even goes even further, a step further for those private workout guys because you get to see them really in certain drills that would test them for this scheme and this defense, this offense, whatever it is. So I think the top 30 visit for me, I view it mostly as a way to just keep doing homework. You, you got to keep doing homework on everyone in this draft. You got to make sure that you know a little bit about everyone, hopefully a little bit more than a little bit about mm -hmm. everyone and really round out all of the evidence that you can gather to make the best educated guess at who's going to extrapolate what they did in college to the mm -hmm. next level. So yeah, it's really about doing homework more than anything in my opinion. That's a really good way to put it. Um, Eric, I know you have some thoughts on that as well. Like, cause I, I think, you know, you ret retweeted something along these lines uh, roughly about an hour ago. And then we were talking about it offline. I feel like people can see the top 30 visit tab and think like, that means, oh, boom, there you go. That means like someone is like, we're definitely interested in this person. My team is definitely looking at that guy. This increases their odds, so on and so forth. But it to Kendall's point and to this tweet's point, it's not necessarily always about that. It's just a way for teams to, quote, you know, fill out that database and continue to gather data for their whole draft process and round things out. Yeah, and, you know, as the tweet says here, and I think this is a former scout um, on Twitter, but – I mean, he, he, he nails it. You know, a lot of times, you know, fans and even us, you know, guys trying to pinpoint uh, who the bills are going to draft. You know, we look at, you know, who they're taking interest in those visits and the top 30 visit is really the top tier when it comes to getting to know these prospects. And mm -hmm. as we know, Bean and McDermott and this entire staff, they're all, they're always about the person, the character. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can watch all the film, you know, we, you want until you're blue in the face, like we are, and we do all the time. But the portion of a character, you know, and the evaluation of that person and who they are, what drives them. Uh, you think about Josh Allen and, you know, what he, you know, was on paper as far as 
his uh, stats coming out of Wyoming and all of those things that he was dinged for uh, when it comes to accuracy and all that. But when they talked to a guy like Josh Allen, they knew the bills knew that they had a guy that was willing to work to become the quarterback that he is today. And, and, you know, a lot of that is, is discovered in these type of visits, you know, those top 30 visits. And it's not just for this draft, you know, years down the line, when uh, four or five years down the line, when these guys, you know, eventually hit the free agent market or come up for options for trades. Mm -hmm. This is where the, the evaluation starts for those guys. So they'll look at their initial evaluation on them. Then those pro personnel guys, those pro scouts will take a look at his recent film in the pros. What is he like as a pro now? And then they all, they, it's all brought together just like any other evaluation and a decision is made. So these top 30 visits, yes, it's to round out, you know, a lot of times um, files, um, that are not completely uh, filled out all the way for whatever reason. You know, maybe that scout was on the road for a different game. He was, you know, all these different things come up. There's a lot of moving pieces in the front office and the uh, personnel department. So, um, you know, this is just one area. And the last couple of years, it's been very difficult to kind of track these things. So that's what makes this kind of fun and why we're almost yeah. like ramping up to these things because we mm -hmm. didn't really have much access to these top 30 visits and that information because of COVID the last couple of years. So, uh, it's been fun to kind of get back into this, you know, speculation of top 30 visits and what they mean uh, this offseason. I love that point about what it can mean for the future. That's mm -hmm. that was that was my big thing I had start in my notes because we we talk about it all the time, you know, within the cover one team. And we did it, you know, talking about potential free agent fits for the Bills this year. We went back and it was like, OK. Did they meet with this person when they were coming out? Did Bean meet with this person when they were coming out with Carolina? Like so on and so forth. Like you, you look at those guys down the road and when they are potential free agents, you're going to see front offices be like, you know what? We really liked Timmy when he came out in the draft, but he got taken before we could. Now he's an unrestricted free agent. And then Eric, exactly your point, like, okay, let's take a look at the tape from his last, you know, couple of years. How's he playing now? Does he still exhibit those traits and that skill set that we valued in him when he was coming out of the draft that put him on our radar? And I think that's a really interesting point. Like these visits aren't just like, or any, the scouting preparation as a whole for the NFL draft, right? It doesn't just end with the NFL draft where if you didn't get somebody, it's like, all right, cool. Well, let's chuck all our notes on all these guys. <laughs> no, this comes back in the future because this sets the foundation for future work for potentially bringing these guys in as free agents or potential trade candidates. You go back to your initial notes and it's actually super helpful because now you have your initial college notes and evaluation pieces on a player. And then you get to compare what they've done in the NFL and you get to see what is translated in their game. What type of professional are they rounding out to? So the whole evaluation process and the interview process in general for teams is tremendously important, but then also adding in the fact, you know, Eric, like, like you mentioned, and we all know like that culture piece, like the bills are so into that culture piece and it's not just enough to see how you play on tape and see, how you flash and what's your skill set, what's your traits. They want to know what you're like as a person. I think when when AJ Epinesa got drafted and then going back and watching that embedded series with him in those interviews, like you could just tell like during the whole interview process, you were like, oh, like even though we knew already, it was like, this dude's going to be a bill. Like every single one of his answers was just like, it was like it was designed to please Sean McDermott or Brian <laughs> Babel or whoever yeah, was in the right. room. It just like spoke to that. Yeah, and they have that archetype from an on the field perspective, but also from an off the field perspective And this, you know, the, the top 30 visits, it's another way to gather more data, get more sample size, really run these players through the ringer as much as possible. Cause there's a lot of dudes coming out in the draft and these boards are huge. And when you're operating with the best player available mentality, like the Buffalo bills do, you need to know anything and everything. And so again, in this, in this episode tonight, we're going to be taking a look at three players, their film, their skill sets, their traits. We'll be taking a look at Mr. Lewis Seen, safety from Georgia, Mr. Andrew Booth, a Bills Mafia favorite recently out of the University of Clemson, and then Mr. Martin Emerson, another corner who has garnered some attention recently out of Mississippi State. One player who we're not going to dive into film for, but we are going to talk about right now before we dive into the film, is Nick Cross, uh, who had a top 30 visit with the Bills, safety out of University of Maryland. Kendall, I know... You know, you and I chatted a couple episodes ago on this guy's coverage, and I believe in the film as well. We mentioned some things on Cross. I know you've taken a peek at him. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts on him? You know, he's got that athleticism, but does he tick the skill set box for the Bills, the fit? And what are your thoughts on him overall as a prospect? 
I mean, overall, as a prospect, I think he's just someone who needs work. He needs coaching. But that athleticism and the tools that he has that he could then tap into is really intriguing. But, I mean, when you watch the tape, there's a lot of times where, you know, he's slow to process routes. He'll let things get behind him that he just shouldn't. He'll he'll bite on the flat stuff when he's responsible for the deep areas, stuff like that. And then the way he the way he fits the run is like almost too indecisive and patient where he's like almost trying to two gap from like a deep safety position. I, I don't know why he does that, but he's got the athleticism where he could go downhill and make a play if he wanted, but he, he kind of second guesses himself and doesn't really tap into all the athleticism that he has. So I think he's someone that would be really interesting to add to this secondary because we know what the bills have done in terms of the coaching staff and what they've gotten out of guys in this secondary with lesser athleticism. So I think for that reason, it's very intriguing, but there were a lot of areas that could use improvement when I watched the tape to put it lightly. So right. that that's kind of my biggest reservation with him. He, he needs some polish. Same thing. Um, for you, Eric, your thoughts on Mr. Nicholas Cross safety out of the University of Maryland. Yeah, there were times on tape. They play a very similar scheme at Maryland um, under Brian Stewart, which if you guys don't know, Brian Stewart's a defensive coordinator at Maryland, and he coached with Sean McDermott in Philadelphia 2009. He was an assistant on that staff. Uh, so Cross, again, yes, the athleticism. He's got that raw mm -hmm. athleticism. Um, there were some times in split field looks where, you know, Olave got deep on him over the middle of the yeah, field, one. blew right by him. Um, so, yes, there's some processing stuff that he needs to clean up. But, I mean, again, I trust this staff to get his eyes in the right spot and on the right keys. Mm -hmm. But, man, he could come down and, and man up on tight ends. He mm -hmm. can play the slot with that athleticism. Uh, so, I think the overarching thing about a guy like Cross, a guy like uh, the dude from Georgia we're going to take a look at tonight, um, I think that athleticism, that speed is something that we need to start talking about. You know, the Bills play a lot of those two high looks. We've drilled it to death to you guys. Uh, and we saw, although it was only one play, it was a pretty big play. Tyreek Hill in breaking route versus Levi Wallace. And Tyreek Hill busted angles because of his speed. Well, guys like uh, Sign and Cross are guys that can not get those angles busted because they have the speed to match. So getting a guy like Cross, or seeing like you can get those guys matched up with tight ends, but also come and fill the alley, which mm -hmm. you're going to see tonight yeah. from those two high looks, from those post safety looks. And that's one thing with Cross I was surprised to see. When they did go to single high looks, he was that post safety. And again, when you have that kind of speed to run sideline to sideline, to run from 20 yards deep into the box to fill uh, mm -hmm. as a, against the run, that's that's pretty special. And that's something the Bills haven't had. Uh, you know, obviously since this uh, regime's taken over. So again, just a few things to keep a look, keep an eye on when we're talking about safeties with that whole Poyer situation, keep an eye mm. on what type of safeties, what type of defensive players they're starting to look at, not necessarily who, but what type of guys. Yeah. You know, that that's a really good point. Well, both of you guys made really good points on, on breaking down cross and how he fits with this team. I think that's such an interesting one with the whole physical dynamic. Like we've, we've said it for this and, entire past year on different shows and film room episodes on Twitter, like the bills secondary for as good as they are, they're not overly like physically imposing or dominant monsters. They're not tremendously fast. They're, you know, Tredavious white's probably the fastest in the starting secondary. And he's not a burner. He's like a 92 kind of Madden speed guy, which is good, but he's not a burner hide and Poyd are tremendously athletic and rangy, but neither are like straight line speed four, 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 three, 40 guys but they they've been coached up and they're so good with the mental side and their communication abilities. And I think it's really interesting to look at some of the guys, the bills have brought in. And I think cross is an example of that because his physical measurables are just so impressive, like a little over six feet, roughly 212 pounds runs a 40 in the four threes. And you see it play on tape. Like that's not just yeah. testing speed. You see him when he's in the single high looks like you guys mentioned, like the range to go sideline to sideline. It is mm -hmm. genuinely impressive. And Kendall, we said it uh, in the film room the last couple of weeks. We've said, you've said it on disguise coverage with me. 
we've said it on Twitter, like you can do a lot worse than drafting like a traitsy guy and then having faith in your system to exactly. like the bills do come here and become the best version of yourself, right? To be able to get that, uh, to be able to squeeze blood from a stone, like I say all the time, but it's nice when the stone is bigger or there's more blood in the stone and you don't have to <laughs> squeeze as hard to get every last drop out. And cross takes a lot of those physical boxes for me. My first couple games watching him, I was not a fan. Um, he made a couple plays later in the Ohio state game, but early on, I just thought he was a yeah. non-factor. Um, what's also funny too, Kendall, I mentioned this to you in the DMS. Uh, one of like the Kenneth Walker highlights we use in the film room yes. um, is cross comes down to try and make a play from depth and just get shook. And that happens multiple times. Like he comes flying up and right. just is a little too reckless or a little too out of control. But again, that's something I think you try and coach that up. You know, he's mm -hmm. got the physical tools. You try and rein him in a little bit. Um, it's one of the reasons, you know, I think he's on their board, why he's getting viewed. And then I want to juxtapose him with Lewisine, who we're going to start uh, breaking down first here on the film room. But it's nice to see why um, Cross was 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 a team for the or was a player for the Bills. And I think you're going to see that a lot. Again, traitsy, physical, especially in today's NFL, where to Eric, to your point, you got these fast open offenses. You need to have some physical ability on the back end. And that was a nice segue by me, pat myself on the back, because we're <laughs> going to start on the back end with this film room. Lewis seen safety from Georgia. I feel like he jumped on a lot of people's radar um, this past year, especially towards the end in the national championship game. He had a phenomenal game against Alabama. Um, this first play that we're going to look at here, what I like about this one, so this is a, this is like a wide receiver pass type look. And the key to point out here with scene, so he's in that deep single high safety look. You see him start to come up, but then he recognizes what's going on and you see him seamlessly just transition back track the man going downfield he takes a good angle to the ball and at first i didn't know whether i wanted to show this clip because he makes it look so easy that it's like unimpressive it's just mm -hmm. kind of like oh okay but i think it's that range right and that ability to function in that deep third he's got real real legitimate speed he's a guy who tested well at the combine and at the georgia pro day um you know he's a little over six feet as well, roughly 200 pounds. He ran a four, three, seven 40. And you're going to see that range time and time again, whether it's, you know, coming forward and seeing that burst or seeing some of that horizontal range. Um, I don't think a lot of his coverage gets played a lot. That's why I wanted to lead off with this clip yeah. because he is able to be a factor in coverage because that athleticism and burst that he has, it's not just in the run game. You do see it in coverage as well. And I'll, I'll jump in here real quick because this is uh, one thing I have right in my notes on this dude. Obviously, I talked about lacrosse and matching up with tight ends. He does the same very thing. He matches up with tight ends. He matches up with number three receivers that are mm -hmm. in the slot. But I love that you picked this play, Ant, mainly because one of the things I, I made note of is his body control, his ability yes. mm. at the catch point. He is able to work around receivers, not work through them, out of control. You see the, the control and body control here of working around the receiver to not cause a penalty there, not get that penalty thrown works and makes a play on the ball. He's got really good body control to go with that range. And when he is in the middle of the field, which Georgia used him a lot as like a dime backer match up with tight ends. And again, those slot receivers, he could work with those pivot routes. He could run with those crossers, but more importantly, the body control at the catch point, he can work around receivers and tight ends to make plays on the ball. For sure. I think that's a really intriguing point about him as well. And Eric, you, you mentioned it a bit. He'll, he'll line up in the slot in two by two sets and three by two sets, and he'll cover a slot receiver. He'll cover a tight end, whether it's, you know, bigger guys or more receiver types. Like he's shown his ability in man coverage to, I to say sufficient plus against a variety of body types in a variety of routes, vertical, horizontal, all that kind of stuff. Um, Kendall, what are your thoughts on seeing overall, I guess, in this clip and just what you think of him in coverage? Well, I like, I like that versatility in coverage. And I think to speak to your fears of including this, because it made, it kind of made everything that he did look too easy. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a plus to that. Yes. You, that's exactly. Oh, you're reading my mind. You want to see dudes. You want to see dudes do things effortlessly. I was talking about it today on Twitter about Jahan Dotson's hands. And someone was like, what about George Pickens in his, two drops. And I'm like, yeah, statistically, yeah, he only had two drops, but there's something to be said about how effortless it looks 
when you're making a catch at different angles, how you're making catches, all of this kind of stuff. And the way, like Eric said, to tie this together, the body control and how effortless he makes it all look, Mm -hmm. how he comes over the top of the hands of the wide receiver here and gets around it to the point where he plays the ball in a seamless way to not draw a penalty, but also get there in a really succinct fashion. It's just a very complete play. And it also shows the football intelligence to stick with the play on a play fake. So, I think there's a lot to like about seeing. We haven't even got to his run support oh, stuff yeah, yet, which will. is probably where people will fall in love. And this is and what that- you want, right, guys? As as a safety, you want that eraser. If a guy makes mm-hmm. a mistake like N'Kobe Dean does here, he gets blown by in this coverage. He's in man coverage. He can't stick with that guy going up the numbers. Tremaine Edmonds would never. <laughs> <laughs> we we couldn't go a show without saying Edmonds, right? I guess not. <laughs> but yeah, so you want your safety to be a racer in the pass game and in the run game. You're mm-hmm. going to see that he can do both. And what's nice is, you know, Eric, to build on that point, like he can be an eraser in a variety of looks, like two high looks, zone, man. I think what's nice you see from the Georgia defense, they run a lot of uh, cover two man and he'll be over the top in those man looks, but he'll also man up, like we mentioned, on tight ends, receivers, running backs. Mm-hmm. You see that versatility. But I think what pops for a lot of people is his ability to come up in the run game. This this first one here, he makes a play on, on the ball carrier. You see him highlighted there. This time he's in a two-high look, deep safety there, light box you get from the Georgia defense. So when you see that run, you have to click. You have to come up. You have to close. You have to make a play. He's got such a quick trigger. You see that Mm -hmm. burst and that speed coming from depth. He gets there quickly, and he arrives to the line of scrimmage with bad intentions. But what I think is the the important piece on this one, he makes kind of like the half tackle, spills it uh, or forces it back inside to Devontae Wyatt, who's coming and making the play. But much like the previous play, it's his angle that mm-hmm. he takes that I'm impressed with. He comes flying up field in real time, but look at that. Look at his body position. Look where his head is. Look where his shoulders are. The angle he took to the ball carrier, he cuts off that outside, which forces that running back back inside to where the rest of your help is on that defense. This is something that I think separates scene in his run support from a lot of the other safeties in this class. Ironically, you know, in talking about it with Nick Cross, I think Cross will come up at times and he's a little more out of control and he'll whiff and he'll tackle air. Scene comes forward fast and in a hurry and he makes impact plays on the ball because he takes such a good angle to the football. And it's, you can get caught in that no man's land, right? Like if you play too cautious, you don't get there in time. You don't do anything. But if you play too fast, you get there. But if you're too reckless, you still don't make the play. You need that right balance of intensity and technique and that to be able to play fast but also play under control. He does it here on this one as well. Brian Robinson, someone who we all like. So, again, Lewis Seen is a bit over uh, – I think he measured around 6'2", 199 pounds. Okay. Brian Robinson Jr. is 6'2", 225 pounds. He is a horse. I'm not going to say anything. Let's just watch Lewis Seen come from depth and just bury he Brian buckled. Robinson. He Look buckled. I was going to say, watch, yep, watch oh. Brian Robinson's outside leg. Oh, it buckles. Like, that's force. And Robinson, technically, Robinson is almost the lower man. Like, mm-hmm. he drops his shoulder. He gets yep. low. He's not in bad position. He's not running high. He's not in a position to get blown up. Scene just comes with what? Again, bad intentions, but the proper angle, the physicality, the force. Again, that game speed, that 4 three forty. it's not just for testing. You see it show time and time again. But what's nice is not only is he playing fast, but he plays under control. This is another mm-hmm. one where the hit is the, the hit is the focus. The impact is there. The speed is there. But the reason it's there again is because of the angle he takes to the football and his closing ability, again, to come from depth, which we know in a Buffalo Bills defense that likes to do a, a lot of games with their safeties with one high shells, two high shells, one high and two high looks post snap as well. You have to come from depth to be, depth to be able to fill these alleys. Yeah. And this is great responsibility too. Like they wanted him to be in the hole here and in the alley. Yes. They're running, they're running a run stunt here with Nicobe Dean. He's rushing in the a gap there and basically hat on a hat front side wide receiver stock blocking on the corner. Who's dropping. This is his lane. All right. And I know, I know they got big Jordan Davis in there too, but <laughs> if Robinson hits us at full speed on that angle, there's no way Davis is probably going to get to him. Either way, your safety is coming from depth. And that is one thing that we're going to be talking about a lot tonight with these defenders. 
making plays near or at the line of scrimmage mm -hmm. from depth. These three guys that we're talking about tonight can do that consistently. And, you know, from the safety spot, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, Kendall, what are your thoughts on, you know, you and I have talked about scene for about like a month now um, and just random little like <laughs> one offs uh, on shows and DMS and stuff. You know, the first play that you spoke on, we showed his ability, you know, deep from a rangy ball, you know, playing perspective through the air. But what about his ability to come forward against the run? What are your thoughts? I think the most impressive thing is how he kept his missed tackle number so low. Like mm. at eight missed tackles through the entire year is really impressive for his play style. Unreal you, considering how fast he plays. Yeah, like when you watch his highlight tape, you would think, you know, there's so many bad plays that aren't on this highlight tape where he's just whiffing on tackles just based on his play style. But it's just not true. And I think the body control portion of it and the angles that he takes is such a big part of it and why he limits those missed tackles. I almost want to compare it to like how a basketball player would close out on a jump shot. He breaks down oh, nice. so well as the ball carrier is coming to him. He gets short choppy with his steps, make sure he keeps that angle sound and he makes the tackle more times than he doesn't. His missed tackle percentage was only 9.3. In my opinion, if you're a defensive back, anything under 10% is pretty mm -hmm. solid. This is another one technically counts as like a pass rep, but it's again, coming forward, playing top down. I chose this one. Scene does this a lot, right? And Eric, you'll you'll like this. If, you know, the more you dive into Scene's tape, he executes. I know this isn't exactly you know that type of slice look that Poyer and Hyde do, but he executes that slice really well. And you see his ability to come from top down in a variety of ways, like you need to when the safety slice those routes that on those deep overs and crossers and things like that. But it also works you know, in a similar way against these type of gadget plays in the backfield. Slade Bolden is lined up in the backfield, comes across in that motion. And again, we used it, the, this term earlier um, on that wide receiver pass, seen erases mm -hmm. Slade Bolden. What's also nice, this is about a third and four, and he shuts this down hardcore. You see him read and react and diagnose this play immediately in man-to-man -man coverage. Again, what, what did we talk about earlier? right with him in the in the past game he can man up on receivers and tight ends in a variety of ways downfield horizontal routes or in this one one that's behind or at the line of scrimmage this this route is designed to out leverage him and out leverage mm -hmm. the defense mm -hmm. get him caught up in some sort of trash get him caught with some of the eye candy and looking in the in, in the backfield catching things wrong he doesn't fool for the mesh option in the backfield between Bryce Young and Brian Robinson keeps his eyes on his man, doesn't get caught in any of the trash, clicks, closes, and again, detonates on impact. When he hits, he hits you. Every once in a while, it'll cause him. He'll bounce off some dudes, but he hits with force every single time. He's not so much, and I don't mean this in a negative way because he has good technique. He's not so much a tackler as he is just a hitter. He is mm -hmm. impact. He detonates on impact. And again, this one's nice. The first couple of plays, we saw physicality. We saw intelligence with angles. We saw athleticism. This one is an example of his processing ability. Doesn't get fooled by any of the eye candy. Takes another solid angle. Uses his physical ability to shut it down. Yeah, it's crazy. This is, this is crazy, guys. Because, okay, evaluating 101, when you're evaluating corners especially like slot corners one of the things you look at is lateral speed across the field through traffic can they trail can they mirror a wide receiver going across a formation now this guy's running that slide route here so it's a little difference behind the line of scrimmage but it's treated the same as if he was running a shallow cross right there or, mm -hmm. uh you know Fair at drag. the heels of the defensive lineman drag there so it's the same thing but normally a guy is going to be so worried about getting out leverage he's going to run flat to leverage mm. to play out wide He's going to go right down where he was aligned. He doesn't want to get beat because if this guy gets into the open field and out leverages him, it's probably a touchdown, especially when you're talking about a guy from Alabama. But he is not worried about that. He has confidence in his skills and his speed. And he not only gets lateral on the guy, he is closing that cushion. He is working to the mm -hmm. line of scrimmage. He is working to the ball. And he knows he's going to get there in time to make this tackle. That is incredible speed across the formation through traffic, as Anthony said, this is corner type speed at safety. Like this is yeah. impressive. Yep. And then being able to bring that guy in open down in open field is just spectacular. I love it. I love this play. It, it's real speed. It's game speed. Kendall, this is a kind of play that 
you know, you and I and Eric as well, we love those Washington corners, Kyler Gordon and Trent McDuffie. This is something we see from them in main yes. coverage on drag routes all the time. So it's even more impressive that Scene's able to execute this from a safety spot, no? Exactly. It's that closing ability. This isn't something you necessarily look for for safeties. You're you're looking for that closing ability on corners to see how they minimize this separation space between them on the top of routes and all of that stuff. But you see it here because of his versatility and how he was used at Georgia. He has to show that closing ability. And yeah, like Eric said, he's not getting horizontal with this. He's getting diagonal with this. He's getting downhill as he's getting horizontal to minimize this space that Bolden has to make a move once he has the football in his hands. And by that point, he's closed. Scene is closed. Any space that Bolden has to make a move, it's really impressive how he pairs his athletic testing with intelligence and then how it all gets put together on tape. He's a really impressive prospect. Yeah, and he moves so fast. He basically moves from like the far hash to the far numbers in the blink yeah. of an eye. Yeah. Um this last clip here, not Brian Robinson Jr. in the backfield this time, um, another Alabama running back, but another, I just had to include this one in here because he just rocks the hell out of this running back. Again, yeah, another, oh, come from depth, fill the alley, angle, form, bad intentions, impact, all that kind of stuff. You see it even better here on the end zone. You can like, oh, he just buries guys when he comes from depth and this is a piece that I think makes sense in this Bills defense. You have somebody who has the range in single high and two high looks, but more importantly has that ability to come from depth and make plays against the run. And in this Bills defense, we've said it ad nauseum on all of our shows, on Twitter, all that stuff. The Bills love to go light boxes. And when you go light mm -hmm. boxes, you're going to stress your safeties because they have to act as that extra fitter in the run game. And it puts them in conflict constantly. That's what makes Poyer and Hyde one of the many reasons why Poyer and Hyde are so valuable and why they deserve to be all pros and in that conversation every year because of their ability to come from depth and fill. You've got somebody in Lewis Seen who played in a top defense this past year and who was very comfortable in this type of role and filling these types of responsibilities that the Bills ask their safeties. When they brought him in for a top 30 visit, I thought it made sense based on skill set, based on traits, and based on fit. And he's somebody who, if the Bills do potentially bring him in this year, I don't think he's going to obviously usurp Hyde or Poyer, but he's a nice potential chess piece with right. the physicality that he has, the yeah. speed that he has. And that's something that, as you start to inject in this Bills defense, again, Aside from Tremaine Edmonds, and Matt Milano is like quick and athletic, but the Bills don't have a ton of just pure speed on this defense. Ed Oliver is very fast for his position. Now we have now the Bills have Von Miller, but you don't have an overly physical or overly fast defense with the Bills. You just have a very technically sound, responsible, mm -hmm. intelligent type of defense. Lewis Seen is the type of guy who, even though he's one player, he potentially moves that needle a little bit because of his physicality and because of the speed that he possesses. And I think that, you know, it's a good fit and it makes sense why they potentially brought him in. Yeah. And I do just to kind of wrap it up. I do find it interesting that that top 30 visit was announced Pretty much on the same day that Poyer hired that new agent in Drew Rosenhaus. I do Very think there's point. some gamesmanship going oh, on there. Oh, boy. Uh, I, I think there is some gamesmanship, of course. And then, of course, you know, they're probably rounding out their file as well. But I personally, I love the guy. I think he's a good player as a safety. But the chances of them actually drafting him, probably slim in my opinion. But, right. I mean. They'd have to get him in the second round. Like, and right. I don't know if they're going to spend and that's that the, And that's the other part, right? That's the other part, like. A lot of these top 30 visits could also be guys that, hey, just in case, let's do a little more work on this guy. He, If he falls and there's a chance that he's a few picks ahead of us and we can move up in the second round to get him, then we're talking value. It, that stuff happens too. That's another portion of that that whole evaluation, the top 30 visit talk that we led with uh, in the film room. Yeah, I think that's a, a spot on point. Kendall, what, uh, just to wrap it up here, um, Mr. Scene, I have a second round grade on him. Eric, what do you have on him? Uh, late first, early second. Late first, early second. Cool. Um, Kendall, what do you got? Yeah, second round. I, I think the Bills will have a tough time having him fall to them at 57, but that's why you do your homework. If he falls yep. to 57, you, you better have your homework done.
Yeah, and we saw that similarly last year with the with Basham, you know, the, that embedded exactly. series and them being a McDermott talking about like, hey, if our guy's not here, we're going to do something. And then they were just overjoyed and elated that Basham fell. They were not expecting that whatsoever. And I don't know if Eric was expecting to be as enthralled with this next prospect as he was a man who can fly without a cape, who is, I, you know what we should, you know what I'm mad at? I should have done some sort of Superman transform in a booth type joke for this. I'm mad at myself that I didn't do it. You yeah, missed, I'm pretty you disappointed. missed on that one. I yeah. missed. I'm, I'm not joking. I'm genuinely upset at myself, but spoiler. Yeah. This next guy is Andrew Booth. Um, Eric, you dove into him in, in terms of picking his clips and everything for, um, this game and you know we talked offline previously you had him behind Kyler Gordon in your rankings but after this you bumped him up your board what did you see from Booth that you know got you excited and caused you to start to rearrange things a bit well the thing with him is uh if we're talking bill specific you know he played a lot of zone which that's good mm -hmm. for the bills right you know I think he played in the 62 percent zone uh range over the course of the last two years but um, I went back to some of his film last season and I, you guys saw some of the highlights there. I broke down, uh, I did a video of him, uh, that dropped, uh, late last night. So if you don't get it, didn't get a chance to watch it, go ahead and take a look at it after the film room. Um, but he's a guy that just, he's scheme versatile. We always talk about that. Yep. And when we're talking about Trey white and where he's going to be to start the season or the first half of the season and what type of player you want opposite him, but what type of player that you want just in case he isn't there, or if he does get injured down the road, you want to have a guy that can fill in and execute his role. And I think Booth could step in and do that immediately as a rookie. But also, I think he also fits that role, that off corner, that you know zone type mm -hmm. off corner to the field against the trip side of the formation. You have Trey locked to the solo side. He's that guy that can read those passing combinations from off coverage. But more importantly, why I think the Bills love this guy, and specifically McDermott, is his ability to fly down to the line of scrimmage and make those tackles yeah. near the box. Now, he does miss some as well, but we also have to, again, frame his play. Frame his play, frame Emerson's play, the next guy we're going to take a look at. These guys are making tackles from depth. We're talking 10 yeah. to 12 yards in off coverage versus the run and those quick game passes. They're flying down into the box uh, to make stops at or near the line of scrimmage. They're flying into the box and punching wide receivers in the face that are trying to stalk block them. He takes a fight to receivers. He takes yes. a fight to those running backs. And I think that's why the Bills will love him as a competitor. They can clean up the tackling stuff. Exactly. That's mainly, that's mainly again, control, coming under control, scalloping in mm -hmm. into the into the, the, the ball carrier and making those form tackles. We saw issues with uh, Levi Wallace at the beginning of his career when it came to tackling Taron Johnson, maybe the biggest uh, change uh, yeah. as far as tackling goes. Remember him? He was just throwing his body all over the place. <laughs> hurt his, hurt Injured his shoulder. shoulder every every week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and but we love him. We love that dog yep. mentality. And exactly. I think B Booth brings that when we're talking about that. And I think that's why the Bills will love him. But he also has the feet. He has the quickest feet mm -hmm. in, uh, among yeah, like uh, the does. pack of the top corners in this draft and he uses some of the techniques that Trey White did coming out of LSU kind of that motor mirror technique you know you're up and press and instead of just opening or press you know bailing he can backpedal real quick with those six inch steps and mirror mm -hmm. the wide receivers release until that uh, receiver you know kind of declares whether he's releasing outside inside in outbreaking he's got it all I think he's got the competitiveness he's got the footwork to play in man coverage and I think he could probably even be better in man coverage over time because yes. again, it's not something he did a lot of. And then the ball skills. I mean, you guys seen him. He he's he can fly. He can basically Literally. fly through the air. He can levitate and float. Like whatever adjective you want to describe it, he can do it as far as you know, making plays uh, on the ball. Um, so yeah, I, I, he had he's moved up uh, for among the corners in, uh, for me. And I just it's hard for me not to picture him in the Bill scheme after studying him the last two years. Yep. I think that's a very fair way to look at it. Like his skill set, it just seems like such a natural fit for one, his individual play style and skill set, but also what the Bills need. Kendall, I know you and I have talked about his athleticism. Eric talked about it. Talk about Booth a little as a prospect and then kind of to build on Jason's question here. I think Jason's question is full of a lot of variables, but in essence, if Booth were available at pick 25, 
what do you think the priority level is for the Bills to take him, and how comfortable would you be with Booth at pick 25 if he were there, given what you think of him? So I'll talk broadly on Booth as the prospect. A lot of it is just really echoing what Eric said. It, it, it is everything he just said. He's so athletic, and I think the jury's still out on what his numbers will be, but I don't think there's anyone in the league that's necessarily concerned what those numbers will be after watching the tape. The dude is just so quick, so yeah. twitchy, so bursty. Everything that comes with athleticism, he's got it. He's got it all. And the thing that Eric said about his competitiveness, mm -hmm. I see it as just feisty. He is yeah. just feisty. Mm -hmm. He brings the fight to wide receivers. If it's in press, if it's in run support, whatever it is, he is trying to punish those wide receivers and make his presence felt. So I love that about him. And I think McDermott loves that about him. And it's really just going to be about reining it in getting him a little mm -hmm. bit more under control. And once that's there, I mean, he's a complete prospect. Everyone in this draft has something that they have to work on, and that's his something that he has to work on. Talking about him at 25, I think it's just a no-brainer. Like, especially mm -hmm. when you're talking about the type of prospect he is, the type of tape that he put up in 2020, and yes, he had a slight step back in 2021, but he still showed all the same flashes, so it's not necessarily concerning. Um, if he's on the board at 25, it fits in terms of a round projection and it fits in terms of team need. It fits in terms of scheme fit. It fits in terms of archetype fit, his okay. measurables, all of it. It fits. I don't think there's a reason that the bills should pass on Andrew Booth at 25. If he's on the board, regardless of whoever else is on the board, I think it makes sense for a multitude of reasons. I like that. And I like how easy my answer can be now. I echo everything <laughs> you guys said, his athleticism, his twitchiness, his burst, his, ex his how explosive he can be coming forward, going back scheme versatility. You know, I don't want to harp on it too much. Let's jump right into the film and Eric walk us through, uh, you know, this first clip that you picked for Mr. Andrew Booth. Yeah, I have four plays, really three, and then one just, you know, him floating in the air. But um, <laughs> I, I want you guys, because we talked about his ferociousness, his competitor, uh, you know, mentality, the alpha mentality. But he's also the kind of like that lifeline, that emotion of the defense. When he makes yeah. tackles mm -hmm. like these from depth, again, look where he is aligned on the numbers here near the 40-yard line. He basically makes this tackle on Cook. George is trying to run that little swing screen to the top of the screen. They have a hat on a hat, two receivers out there on, on Booth and his uh, teammate there. And they're just swinging out there. And watch how quickly he breaks on this ball. As soon as Cook is swinging out there. He is coming downhill. He's shooting the lane, and he's making the tackle in the backfield. This is over 11 yards away. Tremendous <laughs> click and close ability here. And again, the sideline goes bonkers. Look at the sideline there. Like, mm -hmm. you see yep. that. And he, if there's a lull on the defense, he makes plays that gets the sideline up out of their seats, you know, and jumping around. Like, he's just an emotional guy. And sometimes that does work against him, but I mean, just look at him come downhill, guys. This is uh, an awesome, awesome play from depth. Yeah. Yeah. He's in the backfield before Georgia really even knows what's going on. Um, this, this play holds a special spot in my heart. I was watching this game live when this happened. I retweeted the video clip of this that came out like a minute after because it was such a high impact play. And I tweeted, give me Andrew Booth in round one over everything else. And I think it's funny that we're sitting here right now. Like it just seeing, Oh, and then what do you got there? Third down, third down, third down, third down, making an impact play. And that that's even a big thing too, right? Like we, we mentioned that alpha mentality that booth has, this is an alpha play. Like this is literally him blowing up a play all on his own. He's running by the wide receiver trying to block him. He blows the play up in the backfield. It's a high leverage situation. Also at this point in the game, just to add context to it for everybody, Clemson came into this game as one of the top teams in the nation. This was a hugely important game for the tone of the season. Clemson's offense was not ready to compete with Georgia, but this game was still very close. Clemson's defense was keeping them in it. This was a huge play for him from a potential momentum swinging aspect from Booth and what this Clemson defense needed to do. So you had the context of the game, the stage, this granular individual situation on third down. You see him flexing right there. Like, yeah. and Eric, I love how you mentioned how excited the sideline got and how the players did. This is something that Kendall and I talked about last week mm -hmm. in the film room when we went over several of the plays for N'Kobe Dean and Quay Walker. Yep. They make those plays that get the Georgia team 
off the sideline. Like, and when you see, when you see plays being made, that get everybody out of their seat. That gets the whole bench juiced up and geeked up. And that makes everybody on the field want to come and pat you on the head. Cause you just made a baller play. That's a legitimate thing that juices up your team. It changes momentum. It changes attitudes. And, you know, even from just a non-emotional perspective, you see that athleticism and that burst yeah. all on display right here. My my one thing that I would add on this play is I've had some people, I posted this clip and I, I love this. He was blowing up screens all game against Georgia. But uh, my one thing that I would add, I've had people ask me, are you worried about how reckless he is? Is he avoiding or not avoiding? Is he leaving his responsibility and coverage? No. And the thing no. I would urge you to watch in this specific play, you can see the safety replaces him right away. He knows right. his responsibility. He knows he's not responsible for that deep third. So he has free reign. I believe he's in that like kind of sky, um, that sky area on the boundary. So essentially he's playing that 40 yard line and in, and if he's not threatened and he sees the motion, he goes ahead, clicks, closes, detonates, as we love to say. So, yeah. And I, that's, that's an awesome point and, and great to point out because he, that's, that's why he fits the bill scheme so well. He's a cloud corner. He's that, that force player coming downhill to make a play on that swing route with the safety replacing him deep. Kind of like, you know, like the Bills run those trap coverages. They mm -hmm. run a trap. They run that uh, that palms look. Like, mm -hmm. if he sees that guy swing into the flats, he can break on it. And he saw it coming from a mile away. Add in the film study because this is, uh, a, you know, a bread and butter play, a staple play for Georgia. It's a staple play for the Bills. The Bills run this a lot too. But mm -hmm. um, great point, Kendall, about the safety rotation over the top because, yes, as soon as he saw that, he was coming. This wasn't, you know, really a processing play. This was, hey, this, this is a play we've seen on film. If we see it again, if we see that motion, I'm gonna he's gonna fire his gun, which he does. Safety replaces him. Great point. And that's also where that team defense comes in. Like you know that that we like to talk about with the Bills all the time. Like everybody knows their roles and responsibilities and the res roles and responsibilities of others. And it allows you to play mm -hmm. fast and it allows you to read and react and trust your instincts because you know you've got your partner or your peer covering for you on the back end and everybody doing their one eleventh. That's a one eleventh play on that one. Yeah, and here's a here's another one, man. This is again cloud corner cover two type look here, Tampa two type look. Uh, when you when you play as much two high looks as the Bills do, as Clemson does, you play you know cover two, uh, cover two, Tampa two, cover four. Mm -hmm. You're gonna see these smash concepts, two man route concepts that are aimed at taking a shot against Booth right here to the top of the screen. So you see a corner route from the slot player, see just a, a curl route. From the boundary player, it's a nice high-low on, mm -hmm. on uh, Booth here on third and eight. You have a half roll from the quarterback. And just watch how he takes away the short route. So third and eight, that outside receiver runs to the sticks, runs that stop route, and you see him. He's right there. He takes a quick game away. So quarterback's looking at him. That's taken away by Booth. Then watch him kind of slink off just a little bit, kind of fall off so that he helps take away and space the corner route here. But – not only does he help kind of deter the throw, but it gives his safety time to break on that. So he's kind of deterring that throw to the slot, which forces the quarterback to come back to his initial read, his initial option. And that's the guy that was on the boundary. But that guy is at the six right now. He's a yard past it. But because of where Booth is and how the quarterback's thrown from the short side of the field, just near the numbers, he has to try to uncover and kind of work back to his quarterback, kind of QB, be QB friendly. Well, what that does is puts him behind the sticks and then that's when Booth closes and ends the play short of the six. Third and eight ends up being fourth and one, one and a half. And it's all because of Andrew Booth's play against that smash concept. Just awesome, awesome stuff as a cloud corner as that, uh, again, that corner and the too high look of taking away the deep and high look and then just coming back and making a play short of the sticks. That's huge, right? Like the ability to take away the high and the low in a high low concept designed to put you in conflict. Like he's he's the conflict guy. Like he's supposed mm -hmm. to lose on this because if he comes up on that on that curl, you hit the corner route behind him. If he sinks too far into that curl, you hit the hitch and boom, it's an easy completion for a first down. I love this one from Andrew Booth because we all talked about it in our overall view of him before leading into the clips here. We kept talking about the athleticism, the explosion, the athleticism, all that stuff. This one is intelligence and his ability to leverage space. And that is mm -hmm. so vastly important. One, in a zone defense, but two, in any type of pattern matching defense as well. Your ability to read route concepts and process and be able to leverage space. I love these type of coverages from defenders where 
exactly what you diagrammed, Eric, like seeing the quarterback have to go from like one to two to back to one to uh uh-oh, like, and that's all because of Andrew Booth. Like he single-handedly gummed up the works here due to his, his leveraging space and where he was lined up. And that's a really, really tremendous thing. Ken, part of the part got? about having good co-hosts. I don't have to add anything to this. You guys, <laughs> you guys got it all. <laughs> I literally would have said the same stuff anyways. No. Yeah. It's uh, it, that's the type of stuff that you want to see from your corners when you're in those two high looks again, Tampa two, cover two, cover four, like takeaway options. That's the name of the game. When you're in zone coverage, whether it's single high or two high looks, takeaway options for the quarterback. And in those critical situations on those money downs, now, mm-hmm. this is a play from last year, but it's oh, a God. play just – it reminds <laughs> me of the type of playmaking ability that we see from Trey White. His ability to play within the scheme, no doubt about it. You know, they're running a little trick play here, a little pitch back to the quarterback. And, you know, he can play in zone. He can play those gray areas between his zone and his partner's zone, the adjacent zone next to him. But he also can play, you know, within scheme and outside the scheme. And you see him get up over the top of the safety here, a play that was meant to attack this guy right here. He plays above the scheme, but he also plays above the rim on this play. <laughs> Dude freaking nice. Goes. Nice. He is Great floating. Setup. Look at this end zone angle. It's just an amazing play deep. That overlap of his uh, safety there is just incredible. Like this is the type of stuff. I know we probably, you know, wear this out, but you can't teach this type of stuff. You can't fly. Oh. Na- I mean, this is just natural. And, and so a lot of people worried about his athleticism, you know, what his speed is, what his testing numbers is. This kind of gives you an idea uh, on what type of player you're getting athletically. This dude just floats right there for the interception. Again, kind of an eraser type play where, you know, the safety was initially beat. He just sees it. There's no one in his zone. He flies over the top to help his safety, makes a play outside of the play structure and just uh, an incredible play at that. Oh my god. Yeah, it's this is the the first play he blows up that screen and it's burst and it's physical and then oh this is the angle. This is I don't even want to speak of it. I feel like it's disrespectful. <laughs> oh my god. Like he's 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 in the air so long. Like he's almost full horizontal. It's it's just it's unreal. Like that again, as corny as it sounds, like that's off of one stuff. foot. One off foot. of one foot, off of off like of a one foot, foot vert. Like a forty-five degree angle vert, where he covers like multiple yards through the air, and then has the ball skills and the hands to come down with his interception. <laughs> this doesn't look real. It's, no, it no, look real. no, it doesn't look real. Like you think he's on wires, or this is like photoshopped yeah. or edited somehow. Circus. Like it's 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 something that again, like you can't teach it. It's something that I think makes him such an exciting prospect for any defense, let alone the Bills, who could use this injection of athleticism, speed, burst, and an ability that you can't teach. You know, mm-hmm. the intelligence part is is a big one, right? You can't always teach that. You can't teach someone necessarily how to grasp the game and be able to process and do things. But you also can't teach them these physical God-given gifts that he has. And this one also is, you know, also a credit, I think, a little bit to his mental game. Like, you see, exactly, you're highlighting the route concepts, right? So he's dropping back, and he sees – What's going on in front of him? Look where his head is. Look where he's watching. He's watching these patterns and these routes develop in front of him, and he understands what's going on. So he leaves that deep dig. He doesn't come up. He doesn't bite. You're diagramming it perfectly. We're in sync right now. He doesn't come up (laughs) and play that short route. He continues to drive downfield. This technically isn't his play, isn't his man. This is him, Eric, like you said, playing above the scheme. And I love that you mentioned Tredavious White. We see him do that all the time. The big one that sticks in my mind, um, that interception on Russell Wilson two yep. years ago on that like third and 18 mm-hmm. where he just keeps drifting because he's reading the eyes and he's reading the route coming from across the field. He makes that interception, and you know that the, that interception that Trey makes, Russell Wilson is going to the sideline being like, he wasn't supposed to be there. Like, why is he there? And that's because he's playing above the scheme. Great players do that. Booth does it with semi-regularity, which is impressive as hell. And oh, you just, how beautiful is that, Kendall? It's it's incredible. The thing I want to highlight is the fact that while he's not levitating on every single play or anything like that, the ball skills that he shows are regular. Like, he makes plays on the football with regularity, with ease, and he's got incredible hands for the position. Like, I mean, incredible hands. Eric, I don't know if you oh. watched the South Carolina game 
but yeah. both of his interceptions <laughs> in that game were the trail, extremely yeah. impressive. Yeah. So it's regular. Like the way he plays the football is regular. It's something that sh- should easily translate to the next level. And it just goes to show the athleticism that he has. It's This is not a one-off thing. This is not a highlight type of thing. While we are showing highlight worthy plays, <laughs> he makes them on a regular basis. This looks like that Jahan Dotson catch against Ohio yes. State. <laughs> Seriously. This is I mean, he too. did this against Virginia too. Like he he was playing against uh I think it was six a six, seven, six, eight guy. It may it might have been Woods. And he was doing this, you know, in single coverage out oh, wide man. against guys like that. And I mean he had an interception against Virginia in the very same way in the end zone. Again, a high uh a critical situation. I mean, the body control, squeezing that route into the mm-hmm. boundary. This is from their spring game uh prior mm-hmm. to the season. But I just wanted to show that like you said, this is not just a highlight reel of him. Like this is ingrained in his traits this is ingrained in who he is he's a playmaker he's that spark plug for the defense and uh just an awesome guy to study a fun guy to study because again he has so many good traits that can translate to any defense regardless of what type of defense you're playing he can plug you can plug him in day one and he could be a starter Mm -hmm. for you and i think that's what you know for me we'll go around the board quickly just on our overall last uh thoughts for booth before transitioning to emerson for me Going back and watching the tape, it just really reinforced my initial evaluation that I had on him and why I, the the recent rumors are exciting, but I really didn't think he was going to make it out of the top 20 initially. Mm -hmm. Like for a lot of people, he was corner one coming into this year and then correct. He, and then he was banged up a little bit Mm -hmm. and sauce Gardner has a tremendous year. Stingley still has this, you know, out of control potential and, and track record that people want to talk about. And so it pushed booth down a little bit and then. McDuffie starts to light up boards a little bit. Now there's some people, it's like, okay, is Booth going to fall? Is he the fourth corner? Is he the third corner? Is he the fifth corner? Some people, I it's crazy as it sounds. Well, to me, it sounds crazy. Some people are putting Kyir Elam ahead of him, and he's got kind of this all over the place, you mm-hmm. know, placing right now. But for me, I think he's easily locked in as a top three corner in this draft. If he falls, you know, to that question earlier, if he falls to 25, I'd absolutely love it. But I feel like he's going to go earlier given what you see on the tape and given what you see from his skill set eric you know we'll start with you and then same thing to kendall is that what you you know you feel with booth as well as he locked into that top three corner and kind of like a top 20 dude in this first round yeah i mean we're looking at grinding the mocks website if you guys aren't uh on that website check it out it kind of aggregates all the mocks that are out there and kind of gives you an idea where a lot of guys are falling you can see andrew booth is Number four right now, his expected draft position is 25.4, so spot on with the Bills. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think it comes down to McDuffie and, and Booth. Like, you know, what, what's your flavor? Because McDuffie mm. is a solid, solid corner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he can do a little bit of everything as well. And he's also a pretty good fit schematically for the Bills. There are some mm-hmm. other underlying factors that make him not necessarily an archetype fit. but Arm length. Uh, for a, Arm length, yes. I don't want to say it, but it, it's a thing. It's a thing. The Bills average is 31 and a half, and off the top of my head, I'm not sure what McDuffie's is. It's pretty – It's 29.75. Pretty short. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's like Dante 100%. Jackson type uh, type uh, arm length. So he's he's a T-Rex, but I do like the T-Rex Trent, Trent McDuffie. I do. I T-Rexes like are sweet. You saw everybody was scared of the T-Rex in that first Jurassic Park. Like, T-Rexes are legit. My little boy was running around the whole neighborhood today screaming he was a T-Rex, <laughs> scaring, scaring <laughs> dogs and cats. T-Rexes so, are sick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I do like McDuffie, but I think Booth, again, the the entire uh, evaluation of him is, you know, he's got the traits physically. He's got the the mental traits. He plays in big games. He, uh, I know he doesn't have a lot of starts under him, but he's played in big games against, obviously, some really good talent. He yeah. showed out. He's played against uh, some really good receivers. And uh, when we talk about scheme fit, he's a lock. When we talk about competitiveness, I mean, I don't know if you can find a, a more fiery guy that I'm sure the Bills would love yes, in this sure. draft. Booth is up there. He's probably top five in this draft when it comes to that competitiveness, and I think the Bills would just absolutely love him. I have a first-round grade on him. Solid. Same. Kendall, round, uh, round us out here on Mr. Andrew Booth and then take us into Martin Emerson. Yeah, round one grade. Yeah, uh, Please, if he's on the board at 25, Bills, do not pass <laughs> please. up. Please, please, please <laughs> heed my words. Take headed of my words. Um, all right. So Martin Emerson. So the first thing that comes to mind with Martin Emerson is length. He's got 33 and a half inch arms. He's six foot one, 201 pounds. He's an archetype fit for the bills. He is 100%. a 
good zone corner. He knows what he's doing. Honestly, borderline, he's somewhere between good and great in terms of zone corner. He just mm. knows what he's doing, his responsibilities. He understands crossing routes and passing on and communication and just seeing everything on the field and then film study on top of that. But um, he ran pretty well for his size, mm. 4.5340. It's nothing, nothing to scoff at. It's nothing you know, crazy fast, not a burner. But when you have the length that you have, you kind of mitigate any anything you're letting up there in terms of that kind of speed. Um, and then his change of direction skills. This is definitely going to be a hot topic. The more film I watched with him, though, the less and less I was concerned about his change of direction. Yeah. Um, it's definitely something that can use improvement, especially in regards to at the top of routes. He will get grabby sometimes at the top of routes. And to me, that shows like a lack of confidence in his change of direction skills. So yeah. I'd like to see him shore that up. And I, I think he can get better at that. You know, more practice. Practice makes perfect. But yeah. I, I really like his fit in the in the Bills defense. Um, he was surprisingly good in off coverage, which I talked about last night in um, on the Air Raid Hour. Mm -hmm. Levi Wallace talked about how difficult it was for him to transition to off coverage and how much he leaned on Trey White and how much the Bills use off coverage. And my first watch through of Martin Emerson, I had him more as a press corner. And then I watched all of his games again last night. And I was like, he's much better than off coverage than I gave him credit for. So most of the stuff I'm going to be showing is off coverage stuff. Um, he's fine in press. He obviously has the tools to be great in press, but I wouldn't say he's completely unearthed all of those tools to be as good as he can be in press coverage. Um, you know, using that length is a big part of it, but I love what he does in off coverage. So we will start with play number one here. Uh, I started off with a bang. He hadn't gotten a lot of pass breakups in 2021. So I wanted to make sure I included one here. He's in off zone on this and the, the wide receiver runs a nice route to stem it to the inside and he flips his hips to the inside of the field, but he plants that right foot mm. in the dirt, flips him back towards the sideline, and he uses his length and his closing ability to get his hand into the into the catch point and break up the pass here. I really love how he couples all of it together, the fluidity in his hips, the zone discipline to keep his spot, and then putting that foot in the dirt, close, use that length, get into the catch point and rip it out too. Cause this ball was all but caught and he fought through the catch point to rip it out. So I really love how he used all of his tools on this play to get the play done. Yeah. yeah, I, that, I, Anthony, I, and, that, and that's that length is uh, you know, it's important on these type of plays. You know, if you're playing off coverage and you're running speed outs against a guy like this, you gotta be able to transition. You gotta be fluid to a certain extent, but also close that gap, close that cushion and, you know, whether you're there right at the catch point or if you're raking it out as the ball is coming down into the belly of the receiver, either way, use your arm length, use those long arms. And he does that really well on this play. Uh, a really good example of, you know, there are different types of corners. There are different types mm -hmm. of body types and, and prototypes. And for the Bills off zone coverage, a guy like Levi Walls playing that role, this this is translatable. This can be thrown. He can be thrown in right into the scheme. This is very mm -hmm. James Bradbury like. Uh, mm. when he was with the Panthers and McDermott. Um, so yes, this, this translates really well, especially at the catch point with that length. He's got a good feel for spacing in coverage and how to leverage space. And when you combine that with his length, I think that's where you see that archetype fit and how he can be valuable. And, you know, Kendall, you mentioned the change of direction. I thought it was sufficient as well. Like I would like it to be better, but I'm not tremendously worried. I don't think it's a huge vulnerability, but what's nice is he uses that length in functional ways in coverage. And it allows him to make up for some of that change of direction, very similar to a way that when Josh Allen first came out, his progression and his reads from a quarterback position, they weren't necessarily there, but he was able to still make these throws because he has a cannon. He could he could arrive late to a read and make a throw because of other abilities. What's nice to see from Emerson is his ability to play to his strengths and allow those strengths to mitigate some exactly. of those weaknesses. And what's nice here on this coverage, you know, you've got a cover three look from Emerson as you started to highlight it, Eric. And 
you know, he's driving deep because he's got that deep third. It's nice to see him read this route in front of him, plant, and then break on the ball. He's not so concerned that he's bailing and evacuating and playing more of like a spot drop look. This is him reading and matching the pattern in front of him, something that Bill's corners need to do. And it's a really smart play from a mental perspective, in addition to the physical ability to actually execute and then break this pass up. 100%. So I'm going to continue on this trend of his understanding of zone principles. And on this play, you're going to see a switch concept from the top of the screen. We're going to have a post from the outside guy and kind of a delayed wheel route from the inside slot guy. And it's going to threaten and put Martin Emerson in conflict here. Uh, this is another cover three type look, but the bottom of the screen isn't really threatened. So that guy never really drops into his deep third. But you see him carry the post as long as he has to, he carries the post as he's in his zone. And you see Matt Corral looking to that delayed wheel route, but Emerson peels off of that post mm -hmm. right in time at that 15 yard line. And he feels that delayed wheel route right behind him. He peels off of it, leverages space nicely, like you said, and, and finds the delay wheel route and takes it away from Matt Corral here. And it winds up, in a coverage sack, more or less. So I love the way that he understands not just spot dropping, you know, like he is mm -hmm. getting to his spot, but he's understanding all the routes that are going on around him. His route processing is really good for someone that's going to translate into his zone corner at the next level. And that's why I think he makes so much sense for the Bills because you saw in that first play, you saw the pattern matching ability there in zone coverage. Now you're seeing how he understands the routes coming at him mm -hmm. and how he can leverage the space in between them to make the quarterback second guess himself and ultimately end up in a negative play. So I really like this play for Martin Emerson. Eric, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, this one's a little complicated too because the coverage uh, looks to be uh, getting jammed up with the motion from the uh, backfield there and almost looks like it's supposed to be some type of two invert with him playing a half, with him playing a half. So generally, mm. whether this is that or, you know, those cover three type looks, when you see two verticals, you should be splitting those those routes. So you're splitting this post with the wheel. So if that's the case, I'd like to see him split these vertical routes a little bit better. But I understand mm -hmm. why he's he I like why he, I under you're right, though. He carries it and he carries it because this guy's behind the eight ball because of that motion in the <laughs> backfield. So so yeah. I understand why he did that. So that's why, like, hey, I'm not going to totally ding him for that. But. Um, I think he should be splitting those verticals a little better, but I understand why he didn't quite do that. Either way, um, that zone processing is there and understanding, hey, this is the deepest threat. That's that home run play because zero number zero is behind the eight ball because of the coverage and how that coverage changed pre to post snap with that motion uh, that we see, you know, the Bills run with Isaiah McKenzie, kind of that orbit yep, motion. Orbit. Mm -hmm. And so um, I can understand why this was jammed up on defense, but, um, take away that threat, take away that, you know, that home run ball, good job there. And then help take away the wheel. And uh, eventually, like you said, coverage sack, good job on the back end. You know, it's funny. I was the whole time I was watching, I was like, is this cover three? Is this, anywhere? I know I had trouble with it too. And I was going back through it. And at the end of the day, what the biggest thing for me on it is what, what do you do when you're wrong? How do you course correct? Like, what do you do if you're out of position or if your side of the ball or your unit breaks or loses or is in an, or is not in an advantageous position? And Corral has the advantage here from the quarterback perspective. Like, he's got a guy open and you just can't get to him. Like, and you see, yeah. again, the ability and the read and the reaction combined with, I think, that length and that size that allows him to make a play on this ball. Corral is, like, looking downfield. Like, he yeah. wants – that he wants post. That post. Yep, he wants yeah, it. He and and I would want it too, you know, like you mentioned, like that safety is caught. So if I'm Corral, I'm thinking like, dude, this is going to come open. I got him. And then Emerson carries this all the way up the field and maybe works again to his advantage that he didn't split the two routes because he takes away this read. Maybe if he's splitting more and playing more to the wheel, number one has, uh, not the actual number one, but the number one from the receiver perspective, mm -hmm. like maybe he has that ability to split the middle of the field and get open on that post and Corral takes the shot. But Emerson puts Corral into conflict, creates right. that indecision, and that wins the snap for the Mississippi State defense. And this is how coverage and pass rush can play together. And maybe yep. these are the types of things, again, like you're looking for a deterrent on the back end so that way your horse is up front if you're the Buffalo the other Bills can get to the QB. <laughs> 
the other funny thing here to kind of wrap up this play is this play, how he's kind of faking it to number one out there, trying to get this flats defender to jump that so he can sneak this guy up the sideline. Uh, it comes to mind, two plays the Bills ran under Dable. One, mm -hmm. a few years ago, Jason Kroom, touchdown against the Vikings. It was a cover three yep. sky look. Same oh, tight thing. end one, Jason Kroom. Yeah, Jason <laughs> Kroom. And then last year, Gabriel Davis against the Tampa, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Very similar play. Davis was in the slot, kind of mm -hmm. faked like he was going to block on the swing screen and then went up the sideline for a big play. Uh, so, yeah, this is, again, uh, another one of those plays that kind of uh, translates to the Bills offense. But uh, <laughs> either way, like we're talking zone defense, whatever type of coverage this was, whether it was two invert, cover three, either way, it's all about taking away options and it's taking away that primary threat. You saw Corral, as Ant said, look to that post safety, look down the middle of the field to the post. It makes sense why Emerson jumped that. And at least at the very, at the very least, Emerson can overplay the post mm -hmm. because he has the boundary mm -hmm. as a, another defender. So it's a smart play in the end by Emerson on this play against Ole Miss. That's what I was thinking too. Maybe we're diagnosing this and like, he's watching it. He's like, man, I knew I had the sideline right there as an extra defender. So like <laughs> I planned this the whole time. Like, but, but that, that goes into it too. Like why, you know, Kendall, as you get into the next one, like watching film can be tough because yeah. we don't yeah. know exactly what the call was or what mm -hmm. the responsibility is. We're trying to connect all these dots and puzzle pieces based on principles and techniques and scheme and putting it all together. And that's what's part of the evaluation process, right? Like that's why you want to bring in a guy like this so you can draw things up on the whiteboard and see where his head is at so you can connect those dots and know for sure that what you're seeing and evaluating on film is what's happening in actuality. All right, so this next play here, uh, the reason I love this play is because he makes play short of the sticks on third and eight, and he plays it high to low in zone. But I also love, if you could rewind it, how he starts in press. I don't know if, th I think this is a coaching point, but he starts in press and you see Bryce Young looking at him and the second Bryce Young looks away, he bails out and he plays into <laughs> off coverage here and he plays it high to low. He plays the sticks, right? He carries... Jameson Williams as far as he needs to and passes him off to his guy in the zone. And then he sees Slade Bolden coming on this uh, lazy out route. And then he jumps Cole it Beasley and makes right a play there. shorter. It is. It's yeah. literally That's the same, same type of route that BZ slow plays that. I love that. Exactly. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> and so he carries Jameson Williams as long as he has to place the sticks. You can see him literally right on the sticks here. And once he sees first movement from the quarterback, he breaks on it. He shows his closing speed. This is something I actually think is very underrated with Emerson. His closing speed is really good. He can really plant that foot and get downhill quickly on routes. And I think you'll see it on this next one, actually. Um, but he gets downhill really quick, quickly mm -hmm. once he plants that foot and he gets through the wide receiver either at the catch point or making a tackle, whatever it is. He closes ground a lot faster than his 4.5340 would suggest. So I really like that about him. And then you couple that closing speed on tape with length. It, it's a it's a big trait that can all go together into ball skills. So, yeah, I love this play from the processing standpoint of understanding the situation on third and eight got to take away the sticks got to make sure you take away the high read first and then he plays that low read once bryce young gets the slow play from slade bolden and he fires downhill and makes a tackle eric this is the type of coverage that or a type of coverage we see from the bills with semi-regularity in terms of matching these type of of three by one set type of looks from the strong side of it yeah, and, and I like uh, Kendall's point. And that's why I love, you know, bringing Kendall and Anthony on these, you know, these film rooms because, you know, you guys always pick up on the nuance to the plays, you know, that that decoy prior to the snap. You see both corners uh, yep. up near the line of scrimmage as the QB is evaluating the play as the play clock runs down. You see them bail off. I mean, even the corner to the top, he's making it look yeah, like look he may even come off the edge. And look right. at Mechie. And, Mechie's and, and, communicating it. He's pointed sure. out like, yo, 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 hot route. Like, check this out. And then they're like, nope, psych. Exactly. Yeah, so and they end up dropping out eight guys. And like you said, Kendall, you know, he does plant that foot. He's in that bail technique. You see this slow play option route here. He's going to break out because you have an off and soft corner. Uh, and he's expecting the quarterback's expecting him to catch the catch the ball. And, you know, again, get some of that yak uh, after catching it, though. And but Emerson is able to drive on that. And I love the angle he takes. First of all, he plays outside in, takes the outside in angle right there. But this is him in a nutshell. He's a very good downhill player. He's a very yeah. good corner against the run. He can come up and make tackles. 
but specifically against the pass, he shuts down and eliminates and minimizes Yak, all right? He is, according to PFF, he has 16, he had 16 stops last year against the pass. So when guys were, were catching the ball, he had 16 stops, which was fourth among all corners in this draft class. And he was, uh, he only had a broken or missed tackle percentage in those plays on passes of 6%. Again, fourth in this class. So this is a specialty of his. When, when the defense, you know, drops guys out in the coverage, plays those zone coverages like the Bills like to do and like the force offenses to throw underneath, you got to have corners that can come up and tackle and shut down the play, especially in these third and long situations, get the defense off the field, get Josh Allen on the field. And this is one of those plays that really just highlights Emerson overall in a nutshell, because again, he comes downhill, takes a good angle and then just swallows up that slot player and really just, it, you know, puts uh, his will and his physicality on him and shuts that play down. And then you can, again, you can kind of see the sideline going nuts there again, mm -hmm. third and long. This is exactly what you want from your corner, your corner to the, the field side here, shutting down that play underneath. This is one that I clipped for Emerson back in February when I first dove into his tape and you guys nailed it. Like this is him in a nutshell. Like I, th I think his man coverage ability and his ability to, to carry receivers vertical in a one-on-one -on -one scenario is sufficient and he's fine, but he's so well suited for his own coverage look here. And for exactly all the reasons you guys mentioned, his ability to read the patterns in front of him, to read the quarterback through the receivers, to play this outside in and the ability to come up and close. And I like the way he closes with that physicality. Like he comes up with a purpose and he gets bold in and just chucks him right down. And that's another piece, right? Like we talked about, what are you adding to a defense, whether it's the bills or anyone, he adds length, he adds size, he adds that frame, but he adds a bit of physicality that shows up when he attacks coming forward, whether it's him taking on blockers, whether it's him coming up to set the edge, make a tackle on a run, or make a tackle against a receiver. It's nice knowing that you have that enforcer piece on the outside. Again, he uses his length, he uses his size, he uses his strengths, and he plays to them. And that, as you guys said, like that's him in a nutshell on that play. Yeah, 100%. And here's the next play that I was alluding to, talking about his closing ability. But you see him here playing with zone eyes once again in off coverage, third down. Mm -hmm. And you see him with the zone eyes. He has his eyes on the quarterback strategically, right? That's what you do in zone. You want to make sure you have some, mm -hmm. some sense, if, it, if it's peripherals or not, eyes on the quarterback. But you can see him zoning in on the quarterback with peripherals on the wide receiver's route but he makes first movement and he closes on this the second he sees movement from the quarterback. Mm -hmm. He knows that this is a stop route once he sees that quarterback hitch for this and he closes on it. If this is a better throw, he gets credited for a pass breakup. It's not a good throw, so he's he's not credited with anything. But you can see here, this is another example of that closing speed, intelligence, processing, all of that stuff that makes sense for him in zone coverage. I just I love his fit, man. Mm, yeah, he he runs he runs the route for the receiver here, right, Eric? Yeah, and you know, Kendall talked about it. The you know, reading the zone eyes. Uh you're you're keeping that wide receiver in your peripheral. You're you're working to the quarterback through the receiver. And you know, a part of being a good zone corner, especially off zone corner, is reading the drop. All right. Third mm -hmm. uh, third situation, third down situation here. You you see that one step drop. Well, guess what? That's a that's a quick game, and that shoulder's pointing to that target. That's a good drive. Like you see, as soon as that shoulder comes around, boom! You see him break with that back foot, that right foot. That shoulder's pointed. That delivery has started. And I think what happened here, the quarterback saw it late, and uh, you know that's not an accurate pass. Obviously, I think he <laughs> saw saw a flash of em uh, Emerson breaking <laughs> on that. So that's what a good you know off the zone corner can do. He can play with discipline. Good zone eyes here, reading the depth of the drop. You know, all of the a lot of these offenses, especially these you know quick game offenses that want to get the ball out of the quarterback's mm -hmm. hands at the collegiate level, and even you know, you know trinkling uh, up to the NFL level is is those quick games and you know those zero one step drops. Bills run a lot of them, um, mm -hmm. and but Josh Allen is able to also hit a twenty yard dig out of a zero one step <laughs> drop too. So um, you know, reading that drop is just money here. Reading that shoulder, breaking on the ball, using that length to, to eliminate that passing lane to that wide receiver, and uh, just great work and off coverage by Emerson on this play. Yeah, I love I love the way he reads this play and processes. And I think that that, that 
the ability to read the receiver through or read the receivers through the quarterback or vice versa, like in off coverage, I think that's something you can see when guys can't do, whether it's in bail or just regular like head up, like off man or off zone coverage. You see receivers who maybe they're peeking in the backfield too much or maybe they're cluing in on someone else and they just get lost in their zone and they lose a receiver. And that's how you get some guy who breaks open and is wide open. And there's no one within his range. Like Emerson's got that physical profile. He's got that archetype fit. Like we continue to talk about, but he's got stuff going on between the ears. Like he's a heady player. Like that's a nice processing piece like that. Eric, you, you hit it right on the head. Like, you know, the situation, you know, where the sticks are, you know, what your keys are and principles of how you read what's happening in front of you. Keep the receiver in your peripherals. One step. Oh, he planted. Boom. I'm planting. I click. I close. I go after it. Like that is textbook coming forward and jumping a route. And that's a really, really strong play from Emerson. And I know you guys love this last one. I had to I make sure I got, yeah. I, I got, I had to make sure I had some sort of like run support type ish yes. play. So we got, we got this play here. You got a little quick screen game to Jamison Williams here, but key in on what Martin Emerson does to Slade Bolden here Poor uses Bolden. his length to disengage from this block. This is what you want to see. And, and I'm going to steal what you said. It's one thing to have length. It's mm-hmm. a completely other thing to actually use it and know how to use it. And he does it on this play. I made sure to have that that circle nice. around him right here because it's the perfect freeze frame to see awesome. him use the long arm on a wide receiver to disengage, yeah. shed that wide receiver block, and make a play. And to those that are saying, seeing this and saying, cool, he just disengaged from <laughs> Slade Bolden, he legitimately, like, sets the edge against tight ends and sometimes some like offensive tackles at times like he legitimately can set the edge against the run if he's asked to do so if the if the offense is in like a tight formation whatever whatever reason he would be asked to set the edge he could do it like he's done it before on tape so this isn't a one-off thing similar to the andrew booth stuff and his ball skills like he can support in the run game so, yeah, I, I I love the well-roundedness and the way he would fit the Bills. I don't know where other teams would have him because I think he's so perfect for his own defense, but I think he makes so much sense for the Bills, and for that reason, he could fall a little bit further and fall right into the Buffalo Bills' lap. Ooh, Eric, what are your thoughts on that in terms of what grade do you give Emerson and where do you think he falls in this draft? Yeah, I'd, I'd put him somewhere in the third, mid to late third round. Um, I think I like him in off coverage, especially zone. I think there's there needs to be some work done in off man, which is something the Bills mm-hmm. do play a lot mm-hmm. of, as we talked about, uh, because he gets in trouble and he had like four penalties against him last year. One of them against Burks uh, from Arkansas. That was, I believe, a fourth down play extended the drive. Um, but what happens with him when he's in off coverage and that wide receiver is closing that gap on him and you know, there's a, it's called a collision point. So he makes contact Mm -hmm. with that guy. And when that receiver makes contact with him, his feet are obviously stalled and they're not moving because he's, you know, flat footed and that receiver came to him. What happens and Kendall kind of alluded to it earlier is his feet stall. He gets grabby and his feet, they don't activate when that Mm -hmm. receiver does break. And so you see some of those issues at those collision points. Um, He just got to keep his feet moving or be able to, you know, get that twitch going in his feet and that spring in his feet. Because we saw far too many penalties at those collision points uh, last season against some really good uh, wide receivers. And and one play I sent to the guys that I'm sure everyone has seen is just a, a, a he was in zone coverage. Jamison Williams ran right at him, snapped off a, a stop route, a curl route, a deep curl route, 10 to 12 yards. And Emerson was like, uh-oh. He didn't know what to do. He didn't break on yeah. it. And as soon as Jameson caught that, he ran all the way across the field. Mechie's waving him. Hey, I'm going to block Oh, I love him. that one. Yeah, All he's the like, way up the go. sideline. And so if Emerson would have just broke on that and mm-hmm. closed that distance, he could have, you know, deterred that big play. But those mm-hmm. are the type of things with him. I think, yes, his change of direction when he is in phase with the wide receiver, I think he's going to have trouble with speed guys. You know, he may be in phase, but as soon as that receiver, you know, gets that outside release and then snaps off a route, he's going to have to take some gather steps to break, to stay in yeah. phase. Mm-hmm. I think those type of routes will give him trouble. Those deep outs, those deep stops and comes back comebacks. Those are the routes that give him issues. But again, in the bill scheme, you know, you, you see Levi Wallace and guys like Dane Jackson and that off coverage, 
there are ways around that. The Bills are okay with surrendering those speed outs and things like that, mm-hmm. those stop routes. Like, as long as you can come up and make the tackle, and we have seen Martin Emerson do that the last couple of years. The other thing we talk about with him is we're, I've seen a lot of people talk about he doesn't have ball skills. Like, he didn't get his hands on a lot of balls this year. Like, okay, did you look at his film from last year? Because according to PFF, he had 11 or 12 pass breakups. According to the SIS, he had 11. So when I went went back and watched that, I'm like, I don't think that's totally true. Like right. Maybe if you're just watching 2021, right, guys? Like, maybe that's the mm-hmm. case. But the whole body of work, when you're taking a guy on you know, day one, day two, you better be looking at a majority of his film. Mm-hmm. Better as a scout have studied, you know, several years of this dude's film. And Emerson has put up solid numbers across the board every year that he's played in that defense. So great fit. Obviously a scheme fit. Obviously uh, archetype fit. Um, and I could definitely see him translating into the Bills scheme quite easily. Uh, so that was good work by uh, Kendall pulling those clips. Yeah, yes, big sir. time. Kendall, you know, I know you you pulled those clips for Emerson and Eric gave his final thoughts on him. Why don't you give us uh, your final thoughts on Mr. Martin Emerson, your grade you got on him and, you know, overall thoughts. Yeah, I think he would be a third round player for me. I, I'd be kind of shocked if he goes in the second round for those same reasons where it's like he has those routes that definitely trouble him and he gets grabby. And for that grabbiness, you kind of wonder how confident is he in his change of mm-hmm. direction skills. So there's some stuff to work around there. And I, I'd say there are more things that he has to work on than a Andrew Booth, which obviously sure. lands him two rounds lower. Um, and there are questions about what he can do in man because he's good in terms of his reactive athleticism, but it could use some improvement and playing a lot of zone will mask some of that reactive athleticism issues or any concerns mm-hmm. you would have in that regard. So I think if a team plays a lot of man, you might not really love him, but if you're a team that runs a little bit more zone than man, you can mask some of those deficiencies. So I, I really love him as a player in terms of fitting the Buffalo bills. And that's why I'm so high on him. I definitely understand, you know, around the league, maybe just national scouts, whatever may not be so high on him, but you know, scouting with the critical lens for the Buffalo bills probably has me a little bit higher on him than maybe some other corners in this draft. But yeah, I think third round is probably the, uh, the average, that median point for him. Yeah. I sang in that notion as well. Late third, uh, for Mr. Martin Emerson for me and, you know, to echo those same concerns. Yeah. I, I mentioned it, I've said it for a couple of the corners in this draft, like the, lack of a like five yard chuck area in college football. I wonder how certain guys translate to the NFL because of how grabby they're allowed to be in that collision point, Eric, like you alluded to um, how much are they going to get called for that in the NFL and Emerson, when he is in press, he gets very physical and yeah, you see that grabbiness mid route on a lot of different stems with him because of, again, I think it's that footwork and I don't know if it's a confidence issue. I don't know if it's more of a change of direction or because he is a leggy kind of guy and he physically can't do it, but he relies on that grabbiness and that physicality. And I wonder how many, you know, penalty, illegal contact, five yards, first down, like how much are we going to see that with him at the next level? But you got to find some of the stuff, you know, encouraging from him with his zone coverage, with his press ability, with that physicality. Like if you're running a cover two man, I think he, you know, he plays in that trail and just reroutes underneath or you're playing cover two or you're playing cover three. I think he fits given his length and his intelligence and his savviness, but you know, an intriguing guy in the back end. I think he's someone for bills fans to keep an eye on because of his skill set and his archetype fit, like we mentioned. And also just from the idea of, if the Bills decide to strengthen Josh Allen in these first couple of rounds, if they go running back receiver or receiver running back, or they go interior offensive line, you know, maybe the first corner they're taking off the board doesn't come until round three. And then you're starting to dive into those Martin Emerson waters and the Cam Taylor Britt waters, potentially, if he doesn't go in round two, you're starting to look, you know, at corner eight, nine, 10, 11 in this draft. So he's definitely somebody to keep an eye on based on his fit and the bills bringing him in. And we think because of that fit, he's someone that we've had earmarked for a long time and a long time. Isn't really what I'd use to categorize this episode for us. We're under an hour and a half right now, which is very (laughs) impressive for us here on the film. I'm going to pat ourselves on the back as we start to wind down and wrap up here. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Eric, you have been tremendously active with the, 
cover one uh, feature series that you've been doing and just a, a lot of clips and chop ups and some videos for Gabriel Davis and Stefan Diggs yeah. and Drake London, a whole bunch of things left and right. So why don't you let the good people know what you've been working on and what you got uh, cooking and moving forward with. Yeah, I mean, if you guys missed out on some of the video stuff that we've done, on top of the having podcasts uh, every single night live, <laughs> um, I did a Gabriel Davis video kind of chronicling his uh, his uh, season and his role going forward. Um, you took a look at Drake London, another talented wide receiver prospect uh, in this draft. Um, I did Andrew Booth. Again, I dropped that last night, so make sure to go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, I had, I mean, I had to say 25 minutes worth of film. I had to cut down into that, uh, 10 to 13 minute range. So, uh, was there was a lot of stuff I had to, yeah, I had to leave stuff out, but, um, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> literally. Um, but yeah, so if you, if you guys missed out on those, you know, when you get a chance, get to the YouTube channel and take a look at those. Um, it's something that we're going to be doing a little more of. It's partly why, you know, sometimes I'm not able to join the guys live Tuesday nights. Cause as, as these guys will attest to. <laughs> Preparing for this is not easy. There's a lot of no. legwork that needs to be done, not just watching the film. And again, we watch several games on each of these prospects mm -hmm. that we talk about. And if we don't watch film on guys, we're not going to talk about them. We're not going to share our opinion. We're not going to take the opinion of someone else's and pass it off as our own. That's mm. going to give you the truth here. So we don't parrot um, takes here. Yeah, we don't parrot takes, as you guys know. We try to set the trend. Um, so uh, yeah, if, if you guys haven't gotten a chance to take a look at some of those videos on top of the podcasts, all, all of the coverage you need for the Bills and the NFL Draft is at the Cover One YouTube channel. If you guys want a free draft guide, our national scout, Russell Brown, just dropped his draft guide this morning. Good boy. It's, it's, it's so extensive. There's so much research that goes into this, background stories on players. Um, he put a lot of work into this, yeah. and it's free. Get to the Cover One site, CoverOne.net. Download that for free. Show some support to Russell because he's our guy. He's our grinder when it comes Amazing. to being the scout, uh, the, the college scout for Cover One. So with that said, yes, get to our sites. Get all the content. We have you covered. And keep an eye out for some film room sessions with some players coming up over the next Ooh. few weeks. But more importantly, Ooh. a bunch of us are going to be getting together in Vegas for the draft. And uh, mm -hmm. we got some fun coverage uh, you know, plan for you guys on scene, but also live and at home uh, for some live streams. So uh, be on the lookout for all of this coverage over the next month. The best in the business. That is us. That is cover one. I got to put a timeout though in our wind down because we got a super chat and we got a question that came along with it. Hey. You guys know the rules here. Silas mm -hmm. is always riding with us. One, thank you very much for your donation, Silas. Two, he asked a question. Kendall, I'm going to start with you here. Silas says, would any of you be happy with Emerson as CB2? Kendall, we're going to lead off with you. What are your thoughts? I think happy is a little bit too strong of an ad adjective. I I'd be very content. Like, <laughs> if the Bills did wait till round three, like, that's not my preferred route. But if they wait till round three and they get Emerson and he's the, he's the starting CB2, I'd be content. But I'd be happy with Andrew Booth. Right. Oh, I like the way you put that. Eric, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you framed it perfectly. And, you know, if, if the Bills end up starting a guy that they draft or we think he should go in that third or fourth round, whatever, you got to expect that they're going to be kicking the tires on guys that are cut loose during training camps mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They're going to bring in a vet because they don't want to just rely on a guy like Emerson, who, again, we think can you know schematically fit and he has the traits to play that off corner position. But if a guy like Emerson, he's not just going to come in and beat out Dane Jackson. Like right. he's not just going to come in and beat out a vet that they, you know, snag off the streets that may is, you know, maybe is cut loose from another team. Price um, so, so yeah, I mean, there are still guys out there and they're, they're pretty deep at that position as far as corner goes when it comes to the free agent class. So um, I, I think content's a good word to use Kendall. Um, but I do think that regardless that they're going to probably bring someone in to compete. Um, but mm -hmm. if they take a guy early, like Booth, like, I'd be surprised if Booth can't beat out any of the other guys they bring in. Right. Right. Correct. And I'm, um, I'm going to round it off there with that thought. Like if I'm fine with Emerson and I, I'll even venture into the world of happy with Emerson, because for here's, here's my thought process behind it. If the bills got Emerson to be CB two, to me, that means they took him in round three or round four. And that means they ended up with like, like if you're telling me the bills got Olave, Kenneth Walker, and then Martin Emerson, Okay. Right. Like, 
I'm okay. The reason they took a corner in the third round is because a sweet wide receiver fell or maybe Zion Johnson somehow fell or some right. top level player at another position, someone fell. And that's the reason they didn't go corner earlier. That's the reason I'd be fine with it. If we're talking in just like a one-off scenario, there's plenty of other corners. I would prefer it to, to Martin Emerson, but given where we think he's going to go in the draft and the grade that the bills have on him and that we have on him, I would think he went in the third or fourth round, which means the bills got value and positions of other right. need um, ahead of him, which right. is why I would lean a little towards happy, but I think content is spot on Kendall. I'm always content whenever you and I do a show together, you crushed oh, it again tonight you, and you're welcome. It's a lie. I hate you. Why don't ah. you tell the people, <laughs> why don't you tell the people what you got working on, uh, what you're working on, what they can find uh, from you and where they can find you and all that good stuff. Well, uh, right now I'm left filling the cracks in my evaluation for all the players that I haven't really scouted yet. Uh, there's a lot of late round guys I haven't gotten to yet. So don't be surprised if you don't see a lot of film clips from me because some of it may be ugly because they're day three guys. Uh, but you'll see me tomorrow night on the Air Raid Hour. I believe we're doing our no matter what lists. Which tomorrow is, is Wednesday, fun. Kendall. There's no Air Raid Hour on Unbelievable. Get together, Kendall. You're, you're working gracious. too hard, man. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> it. Either it's way, hey, I'll, 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 I'll be horse. on soon. It'll feel like tomorrow. No, it'll, it'll be on <laughs> Thursday then. Um, yeah, we'll be doing our, no matter what list, I think, I think we'll only be doing offense. I, I don't know. I'd have to check the schedule, but either way, it's always a fun episode where we kind of share our favorites of who we want the bills to take, no matter what, a la the movie draft day. If anyone hasn't seen it, sorry for the spoiler, but, um, yeah, I, I know some, uh -huh. everyone has to have seen it by now, but yeah, no, that's, that's really what I got left. Just filling the cracks to my evaluation with with all the prospects I got left, I'm definitely not going to finish everyone, but I definitely want to get to those guys that I think will be fits for the Buffalo Bills. So got to fill in those cracks. Fantastic. I'm Anthony Prohaska. Find me on Twitter at pro underscore underscore ant. That's pro two underscores A N T new episode of disguise coverage coming live tomorrow, Wednesday, 7 PM Eastern. I'm very excited for this one. I have Nate Tice on from the athletic, and we are going to be going over the changing nature in NFL defenses and how the Buffalo Bills are built to combat those new defenses in the NFL and what they could do in the draft to further combat um, the evolution in NFL defenses. And going to be talking a little Gabriel Davis, a little OJ Howard and 12 personnel, some running game action, some pivots, uh, very in-depth look at the changing of the guard in the NFL as a whole, and then how the bills fit into that world. So I'm very excited for that episode of disguise cover. So please check that out and tune in. It's going to be great. We got one more super chat and I thought we were out, but we're not. We got every time we think we're mm. out, we got sucked back in Silas again. Thank you very much for your donation and for being here in your comments. Silas agrees with us on our evaluation of Emerson. And then he says, I'd rather have three or four guys who are coming out this year. And then he says, what I'm assuming this means corner. What's your wish list outside of the top mm. six guys and do you think we address strong safety? We'll start with Kendall. We'll start with you. Answer the first part. Who is your corner wish list out of your top six? Oh, that's tough outside of the top six. Probably Taylor Britt, Emerson. I really like Monteric Brown as a fit for the Bills. Good in zone coverage. And then I'm only a game and a half into Jalen Armour Davis, Davis from right. Alabama. But I really liked what I saw so far. I think he's a really good technician. Uh, on the boundary. So I think he would make a lot of sense, you know, another Alabama corner. So um, yeah, th those are definitely my guys outside the top six. I personally, the, the strong safety stuff, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we're going to address it this year. I, I don't, that's just my gut. I'm obviously I could be wrong, but that's my gut. That's fair. Eric, what do you, uh, who's a corner you like outside your top six? And do you think we address strong safety? I, I didn't think the Bills had a strong safety. They're kind of interchangeable. But uh, I was going to say that. I, I was I'm, like, I'm just they're saying, both just safeties. I'll, I'll just, just say that. Yeah, they're one. safeties. They're interchangeable. But um, now I, I'd be surprised uh, if they do address it. But if they eventually do, it'll be at the end of the draft, I think. Because you got to think about uh, the whole Poyer situation. But also, Jaquan Johnson is in the last year of his deal. So I could see them, you know, looking to bring in a safety mate, even if it's just for special teams. And as that depth player, mm -hmm. I don't think they go high with a strong safety or just safety overall. Um, as far as the corners, I mean, we talked about Booth tonight. I like him a lot. Kyler Gordon, I think, is just another any 
any Washington corner is basically a really good scheme fit. Any corner from Iowa is usually a pretty good scheme fit. Anyone from Pitt, uh, Mathis, Mathis. It, Mathis is a hundred percent a fit, except he's fast. So that's kind of like an outlier. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think uh, anyone from those uh, defenses, Mathis is fun. I, I watched his film, very physical guy, very fast, but almost too aggressive, kind of along the lines of Booth, but he's uh, more aggressive mm-hmm. in the pass game up near line of scrimmage. For some reason, he likes to just punch and just whiff a lot of times and he's got the speed to make up for it. But um, so, yeah, I'd say Booth, Gordon are guys that really stand out um, at corner for the Bills. Taylor Britt, man. I mean, if you mm. want a guy that plays a lot of zone coverage, a lot of off man coverage, he's your guy, but he's also mm. that guy that has the feet to match, um, yeah. you know, I, I, other receivers that have speed. And uh, that was his film was fun to watch too. So, yeah, I, I mean, I kind of echoed on a couple of guys that Kendall brings up, but um, those are my guys, I'd say, at corner. Yeah, and for me, you know, if we're just going outside of the top six, Kyrie Elam falls outside my top six. I wouldn't mind him in the second round, given his traits and his tools. And then I, Cam Taylor Britt is an easy one. I mentioned Elam just to get another name in there, but Cam Taylor Britt, explosive, athletic, versatile, physical, um, has some things that he has to work on, but he's another guy who he's got the size and he's got the tools and you coach him up and you round out some of those rough edges a little bit. Um, I think he's somebody who could be an impact player at the next level and a chess piece given his skill set and his traits and then safety. Same thing for me. I think if we address it, it comes late unless like value is tremendous and like Kyle Hamilton falls in the first round. And then it's like, okay, we'll take this guy. Um, but I don't really see it happening in the first four rounds. Maybe round five, but I really see it being more of a late day three, like a round six, um, type of addition, um, given the track record and given how the way the rest of this roster is constructed. Also, Eric, for you, Silas says on Madden, Jordan Poyer is listed as the strong safety. So that was his <laughs> oh, rebuttal. Yeah. To uh, that. I forgot so, about that. That hey, it if, if Madden says it, that's how it is, man. That's I how it goes. I Madden, that. You can't fight Madden. None of us can. It's a giant. It's a monster. It is. Um, <laughs> Thank you guys so much for riding with us on tonight's episode. The chat was jumping, a lot of good engagement, a lot of good thought-provoking questions. Thank you, Silas, for the super chat donations and your questions. You're always very inquisitive. Um, and you always get at least one or two Madden references in uh, every single episode <laughs> that you're here for. So we appreciate you for that. Um, and thank you to everybody for you know supporting us in every way, shape, or form. Please rate and review and subscribe to the Cover One Film Room. And this guy, I'm sorry, this guy's cover one as a whole. I'm so used to the outro for all these other shows. I'm losing it. I'm falling apart. We have you covered every single day of the week here on cover one. And I literally mean that Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Friday. We have a ton of unique and tremendous content coming for you the week of the NFL draft. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, Thursday day, Friday day, Saturday day, the weekend as a whole. There is no one better when it comes to Buffalo Bills content and honestly football content as a whole. Granted, we may be biased. We break things down in a way that not a lot of other people do. So give us a rate, a review, a subscribe. If you're watching this video live, please drop a like for us. If you're listening to it later, that's cool. You can still drop a like. It's tremendous. It helps to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. Thank you to everybody who watched and listened live. Thank you to everybody who listened and watched later to the recording. Appreciate you guys. Thank you to Eric and Kendall for riding with me here and i guess really kendall we should thank eric for finally joining us again and not leaving us <laughs> high and dry but yeah appreciate I got, everybody i got, you. I got you. <laughs> appreciate everybody uh this episode was great and we will see you next week and as always go bills